As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 famous people in the witness protection program. I'm a rat, I'm an informant, I betrayed my dad. Well, I don't think I betrayed my father. He was going to jail anyway. For this list, we'll be looking at high-profile cases of people who turned on their criminal counterparts in exchange for federal protection. Which of these are you most familiar with? Let us know in the comments. Number 10. Vincent Palermo Raised in Brooklyn, New York, Vincent Palermo became involved with the North Jersey Mafia when he married into the DeCavalcante family in the early 60s. I think he was street smart and willing to do things that other people were not willing to do. He was also able to kind of see other people's weaknesses. Palermo gradually worked his way up to becoming the de facto mob boss, but was arrested in 1999 after one of his lieutenants became an FBI informant. With D'Amato dead, the family decided not to appoint a new boss. Instead, they appointed three capos to run the family. One of these men was Vinny Ocean. Facing possible life imprisonment, Palermo testified against his counterparts in return for a placement in the witness protection program. His new identity was exposed in 2009 as James Cabela, after it was alleged that he was running a shady strip club in Houston, Texas. The character of Tony Soprano from the HBO hit series The Sopranos was reportedly inspired by Palermo. When did they flip you? Tell me. Don't lie. Flip? Who? What? Number 9. John McNamara Businessman John McNamara is now infamous for pulling off one of the largest Ponzi schemes in history. Between 1980 and 1991, McNamara acquired loans of over $6 billion from automobile giant General Motors, claiming to buy vans from other manufacturers that he would convert and ship overseas. In reality, McNamara bought a grand total of zero vans and applied for larger loans every year, with which he offset the previous year's debt. His scheme was finally discovered in 1991, and he was arrested on multiple fraud charges. With a 20-year jail term and fines of $800 million on the line, McNamara agreed to rat on the local officials he bribed, in exchange for a reduced sentence and entry into the witness protection program. Number 8. Jimmy Fratiano I just take my chances, try to uh, stay away from them, go someplace where they can't find me, just live as long as I can. Jimmy the Weasel, as he was popularly known, was a mobster who became acting boss of the Los Angeles Mafia in the 70s. In 1977, after a car bomb resulted in the demise of Danny Green, an Irish mobster and FBI informant, Fratiano was arrested for his involvement in the incident. He decided to cut a deal with the FBI, which involved pleading guilty to multiple homicide charges and providing information against high-ranking Mafia members. Likely to make a bundle from a book published on the eve of the sentencing of Frank Funzi Thierry, convicted in great part by the Weasel's testimony. With his life in danger, Fratiano was placed in the Federal Witness Protection Program, under which he wrote and published two books detailing his experiences. They prick your finger with the sword, draw blood, then they take you around to each member of the family, you kiss them on the cheek, you introduce you, and... You're a made member of La Cosa Nostra. Number 7. Vincent Teresa Miranda, uh, we named the company after uh, one of those fish from South America, you know, the, the ones that eat you up as soon as you fall in the water. Before the age of 20, Vincent Teresa had already been arrested for burglary, expelled from school, and dishonorably discharged from the U.S. Navy. Born into a family of Mafia members, Teresa soon became affiliated with the Patriarca crime family, against whom he testified in 1971. Teresa's testimony, which was given before the U.S. Senate, proved to be very useful, aiding in the arraignment of over 50 Patriarcha family members. Naturally, most of them lost money in the casinos, and we got 50% of their losses. Naturally, this put a huge target on his back, leaving him with no choice but to enter the witness protection program. Despite being a made man in the Italian mob, Teresa continued to maintain that he never put an end to anyone's life. Number 6. Michael and Lori Fortier The trials following the 1995 Oklahoma City tragedy ended with two perpetrators, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, receiving sentences of capital punishment and life imprisonment, respectively. Today, the Oklahoma National Memorial Museum honors those who lost their lives 
and the survivors of this horrific attack. In order to convict both men, the prosecution sought the help of Michael and Lori Fortier, the husband and wife who had acted as accomplices. In fact, it's a secret where he is. How is that possible? That a man who admitted to not only knowing about the plan, but admitted casing the Mora Federal Building site with McVeigh. The 40 A's agreed to testify against both men, and in exchange, Lori was granted full immunity while Michael was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Michael received an early release in 2006, having served seven and a half years of his sentence. He promptly entered into the witness protection program afterwards. Fortier now has a new identity and new hometown because he's in the Federal Witness Protection Program. Number five, Frank Lucas. One of the most prolific American drug traffickers, Frank Lucas operated a multi-million dollar smuggling ring, shipping in drugs from Thailand and selling them himself on the streets. Frank Lucas had it knocked because not only did he have the Italian mafia on his side, but he also had the NYPD, an incredibly corrupt organization in the early 1970s, protecting him. In 1975, the DEA stormed Lucas's house in New Jersey, arresting him and confiscating large amounts of cash from the property. After standing trial for multiple federal and state drug charges, Lucas received a hefty sentence of 70 years in prison. He then became an informant for the government and turned over information that helped convict more than 100 drug dealers. Richie Roberts winds up not only finding out about Lucas's empire and arresting all of Lucas's men, but getting Lucas to spill the beans on all the corrupt cops and even on the Italian mafia guys. His cooperation came at the expense of his safety. So Lucas was put in witness protection with his family. The events of his life were depicted in the 2007 movie, American Gangster. Blue Magic, that's a brand name. Like Pepsi, that's a brand name. I stand behind it, I guarantee it. Number four, John Francesi Jr. Yeah, I'm a rat. Yeah, I'm an informant, I'm glad to be. Although he was the son of a mob underboss, John Francesi Jr. never really fit in with the world of crime around him. In 2010, he became the first New York mobster son to rat out his own father when he struck a deal with the FBI to testify against his old man, Sonny Francesi. Well, I don't think I betrayed my father. He was going to jail anyway. But what I did do was tell the truth. The testimony, for which Francesi Jr. was paid $50,000, helped prosecutors send Sonny to prison for extortion and racketeering. Due to the weight of this case, Francesi Jr. had already entered into witness protection four years before he gave the damning testimony. After his identity was exposed in 2017, he opted out of the program, fed up with living on the run. Look, I don't know if I'm, if I'm going to live another 10 years, 20 years, or one day, but I do know that I could live in that day, that 10, that 20 years, to the fullest of my ability. Number three. Sammy Gravano. This isn't somebody talking about the Mafia. I am part of it. Sammy the Bull Gravano is a former mobster who currently runs a YouTube channel and a podcast in which he details his life experiences. They tell you to kill someone. Did you think of saying no? No, not at all. But before he was telling us to like and subscribe, Gravano was instrumental in the takedown of one of the most powerful mob bosses in American history, John Gotti. You know, this is supposed to be Cosa Nostra, our thing. When John Gotti took over, it was no longer our thing, it was my thing. In 1991, Gravano, Gotti's second in command at the time, became a government witness and testified against his boss in federal court. Gotti was handed a life sentence and passed away years later in prison, while Gravano received just five years for his cooperation. Upon his release, Gravano was placed in witness protection, but he opted to leave the program just one year later. Are you a rat? If that's the time you like to use, I don't look at myself as that. I look at it as I was betrayed, I betrayed him. Number two, Nicky Barnes. Known as Mr. Untouchable for his ability to evade prosecution for years, Nicky Barnes was a crime lord who led a seven man drug trafficking syndicate called The Council. He was one of the few African American drug dealers who was trusted by the Italian-American Mafia. In 1977, after boldly appearing on the front page of the New York Times Magazine, 
Barnes drew the ire of President Jimmy Carter, who ordered his arrest. You gotta follow the rules. I mean, the cop's job is to lock us up, and our job is not to get locked up. But you don't go na 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 na. He quickly lost his untouchability when he was dealt a life sentence the next year. Locked away in prison, Barnes soon realized that his council members had abandoned him. In retaliation, he turned over a long list of names to the feds, helping to convict 16 people. When I heard that he flipped, I was shocked and surprised because I had a great deal of respect for this guy, as did everyone I knew. So uh, it did come as a, a major, major surprise. For his cooperation, Barnes secured early release from prison and subsequently entered the witness protection program. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, Henry Hill. To me, being a gangster was better than being president of the United States. A former mobster with ties to the Lucchese crime family, Henry Hill was a notorious criminal whose life story served as the basis for the 1990 Oscar-winning movie, Goodfellas. In addition to drug trafficking, sports fixing, and extortion, Hill was also involved in two high-stakes airport robberies, one of which was the largest cash heist in the U.S. at the time. He was arrested in 1980 on drug charges and decided to flip on his mafia associates, resulting in the convictions of 50 people. Henry Hill did everything he could to make it out of Normalville and into organized crime. For some 20 years, he lived the mob life until May of 1980, when it all came to a crashing halt. He and his family were placed in the witness protection program in the same year, only to be kicked out seven years later after he slid back into the trafficking business. I was in trouble. I knew I was a dead man, no matter how you cut it. If I stayed in prison, I was dead. If I went out on the street, I was dead. So, I, I mean, so my choice was already made. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from Watch Mojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.